My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. We are in conversation with Kareen Kanimba, activist and daughter of recently freed Paul Rusesa Bagina of Hotel Rwanda fame. Welcome to RightsCon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, just a few notes of housekeeping here. Um, we are taking questions online. So please post your questions. I have my laptop here so we can check questions throughout the conversation. If you're here uh, in Costa Rica, there's a QR code on your tag. Uh, tap on that, access that, and use the Slido to uh, uh, post your questions, and I'll get to as many as possible. Also, if you are wearing headphones, um, they're volume adjustable. So just a little bit more about you, um, because you're an amazing human being. She was with her father in Rwanda, right? You were in, with your father in Rwanda in 1994 during the genocide when he saved so many thousands of lives at his hotel and your family did eventually leave, settled in the United States and three years ago, uh, your father was on a trip overseas, not in Rwanda, and was detained and sentenced. He was kidnapped essentially, detained and sentenced to 25 years in prison by the Rwandan government and um, you know, he's once a hero and now a political prisoner. And you've put in a lot of effort to try to release your father. And in the course of that, an amnesty international investigation revealed that your cell phone communications had been compromised. Uh, hack hackers had tried to get to your phone. They did. And with what else but the infamous Pegasus software. So there's so much to talk about um, in the next half hour. I want to just start by asking how your father is doing. Well, thank you for, for this question. Um, you know, as you can imagine, after two and a half years of being wrongfully detained, after going through torture, through a sham trial, through isolation, um, he has a lot of recovering to do, but he's in good spirit. He's being mo his health is being monitored and um, is as warm and kind as he's ever been. He's been spending lots of time with uh, his grandchildren, with his children, and just catching up on, on the time lost, on the two and a half years of, uh, of the time we lost with him. You know, when I was scheduled to talk to you, um, when this uh, interview was first arranged, your father had not yet been released, and this was going to be a very different conversation in terms of tone, right? If he was still in detention, your story is the rare happy ending. And um, I, can you just talk a little bit about uh, the effort that you've gone through over the past two years to try and to release him. Yeah, so uh, my father, um, as you introduced, was kidnapped um, in 2020 from our family home in Texas, in San Antonio, and uh, brought to Dubai and uh, put on a private jet that was chartered by the president, by the office of the Rwandan president. He was, sorry, kidnapped in the United States or en route at a connecting point? In connecting in Dubai. Got it. Um, and uh, that's when he was put on a plane, uh, taken to Rwanda, and then immediately tied up by the hands, the legs, the eye, his eyes were covered and taken into a torture house where he remained uh, tortured for four days before being paraded in front of the media and charged with crazy charges as, as terrorism. Um, he was then made to face a sham trial, denied of all his basic human rights, his access to lawyers and um, access to even read the case file against him. He was put in solitary confinement, entirely isolated, and then sentenced to 25 years in prison. And so as soon as he was kidnapped, our family um, decided to stand up and not to remain quiet. You know, oftentimes when people are taken by dictatorial regimes, they are afraid, they are, remain silent because they are afraid that something might happen to their loved ones. And we were in fact afraid, but we realized that silence was not going to get us our, our father home. And so we stopped everything and decided to dedicate 100% of, of our time to advocate for his release. Um, and this was a, a tough two and a half years journey of knocking on every possible doors and calling on every government officials that we could um, to put pressure on the government of Rwanda to release him uh, from prison. And what was his crime? 
in the end, um, he was released. But, you know, this was after um, being dragged through mud and hell by the government of Rwanda. You know, uh, we were speaking to parliamentarians, to human rights organizations, to different governments. And that bothered them. That bothered them that we were fighting back in mm. our advocacy, that we were speaking out not only about our father's case, about the human rights abuses he was facing, but also the human rights abuses being faced by Rwandans and, and people in the Great Lakes region of Africa and that is being perpetrated by the regime. This is exactly what my father had been doing for over 20 years. He had been an activist, a human rights activist, calling on, on the government of Rwanda to, to stop those, uh, those uh, methods of, of silencing uh, people, of, of, um, of crushing uh, the, the rights and the, the, um, the fundamental uh, rights of all the Rwandans and the people in the Great Lakes region of Africa. And so we decided to do the same, to continue in his voice and to continue to speak about all these atrocities and that is why the government started targeting us targeting him for speaking the truth essentially exactly um, I'm curious you talked about the d decision your family made to sort of talk about this publicly fairly early on and, and often p families are encouraged not to talk about um, a detention of, of an activist um, in fact governments often recommend to the citizens, the families, not to say anything. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because it's clear, I mean, I think you, I know that you feel like it's better to speak, but why do you think the State Department or, or the UK government or whatever make this recommendation? Well, I think that the governments think that by not speaking out, uh, by speaking out makes the negotiations more difficult um, in the efforts to seek the, 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 the person who's wrongfully detained freedom. But in the case of the Rwandan government, um, it's, it's very different. You know, they kidnapped him from, uh, from another country and brought him to Rwanda and then started a smear campaign on the news about him where they were essentially making it more difficult for people to try and, and support him and help him by spreading lies. And so we understood that we needed to speak up in order to counter the lies. And I, I believe every family should do the same, not to be when we're told to be silent and actually speak loud and engage human rights organizations who are also um, reporting on, the, on these types of issues as they're, they're there to help you amplify your voices and be heard by the government's officials who are in the position to use their tools and seek the freedom of those, indi of those individuals who are wrongfully detained. And so the silence was not an option for us. And every single day my father was in prison, we used to remember what he used to tell us. And he used to tell us that when a person is, is a political prisoner, the most important thing is to keep their name alive, their names alive, to continue speaking about them. Otherwise, the regime who's attempting to silence them essentially wins, and um, and that person can be forgotten. And so we decided to follow in his footsteps and to continue to speak about him, but also all the other political prisoners in Rwanda um, who who were being silenced. And um, and in the end, with the support of the human rights community, of governments, and people across the world who heard his story, who heard us speak, who heard. Um, who read reports mm. by other organizations and resolutions by parliaments led them to action and put enough pressure on the government of Rwanda to release him and, uh, and other political prisoners in Rwanda and, and it worked. So I would encourage all others who are advocating for their families to not remain silent and to continue to be loud and to speak. That's very interesting. I mean, there's certainly been families who've chosen to remain silent or has, have been advised to. and. And we have definitely instances where then those detained stay detained for years. Um, you also talked just now about character assassination, trying to delegitimize your father. This is a playbook from the uh, autocrats that I see across many countries. Yes. Um, I mean, dictatorships, autocrats, they follow the same playbook. You know, they are all using the same tools. And the assassination of his character was essentially meant to, um, to make people not want to support him, to, to smear his image so that he no longer has the, has the platform that he used to have in order to advocate for the rights of those who are being um, uh, violated by the regime. And so they did that to him for many years. You know, the Rwandan government has printed 
invented hundreds and hundreds of articles making up lies about our father, and that is exactly what we needed to counter this misinformation. Um, and I think many cases in many other countries and um, authoritarian regimes that use uh, justice as a means to silence people use the same tools and and spread lies. And so it's important to counter these lies and to set the record straight um, and um, and seek support and and for these individuals. I mean, just a few hours ago, I was talking to Sana Saif, who's. Uh brother is in uh, an Egyptian prison. Um, then there's Evan Gershkovitz, the journalist, the Wall Street Journal journalist, uh, now detained in Russia for reporting. Um, do you think we are in a new era? Is this a new phenomenon where activists are being detained by uh, authoritarian regimes and um, their country of citizenship and the government there really struggle to put pressure and leverage to free them? I think it's not only about struggling. I think um, it's the lack of willingness to. You know, we have the tools, we have the methods that have worked in the past, and we can use those methods uh, in order to save this, our citizens who are being detained in, in other countries. And this, in all, is an attack on democracy. It's an attack on on our values and our principles and those fundamental rights that that we all live by. And and that's why it's more. It's even more important to speak, and it's even more important to hold the governments. Um, in charge to account to bring those individuals home. Um, I want to ask you just a little bit about the context for those who are not familiar with Rwanda. Uh, there are elections there, there's a legislature, and yet um, your father was caught up in this situation. Uh, just explain to us some of the basics of the political environment in which this happened. So Rwanda is a dictatorship. It's a dictatorship. The current president in power has been in power for almost 30 years. He's running again for elections next year in 2024. And in the previous elections, he won by 98%, right? So we all know what a that real means. democracy. <laughs> yeah. And um, he has successfully silenced dissent. He has, I mean, crushed on the journalists, on independent journalism in Rwanda. And he even goes across international borders, like in Texas and in Europe and in other African countries, to bring the people who are expressing, who are using their freedoms abroad, to bring them to Rwanda and further violates their rights. Um, Rwanda is um, a country that has already experienced traumatic events. As you know, in 1994, there was a genocide and, mm -hmm. and uh, that took the lives of, of a, over a million people. And, and my father, as a symbol of, of, uh, of, those of um, one of the people who stood up um, in the face of this, of this regime, has continued, of the genocide, has mm -hmm. continued to use his platform to advocate for, for the human rights and to shed a light on the regime and what's happening in Rwanda and, and why people need to pay attention um, to this. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was kidnapped, jailed, uh, subjected to a sham trial and, and silence, essentially hidden from the public eye. And that's exactly, that's just a case study. My father is known because of the movie Hotel Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And that is why people paid attention to Rwanda in this case and, and what was happening to him. But there are hundreds of thousands of people who are in the exact same situation as he is. And that is why um, continuing to remain silent and continuing to go with business as usual, as if Rwanda is a normal democracy, is not the right move because in the process we are hurting hundreds of thousands of innocent people who are effectively being silenced and their rights are being violated. Now you mentioned earlier about the fact that a willingness, right, of, of governments and the fact that they do have tools. Um, what are the tools and instruments that you think they have that they have not been using? So there are tools like the Magnitsky sanctions, you know, these are targeted sanctions on the individuals who are directly involved in the abuse of human rights of individuals. And, we, and that includes um, stopping the visas of those individual, individuals from entering countries like the United States or freezing their accounts and not allowing them to access their, their money abroad. And this is one of the methods that does work. You know, we filed for Magnitsky sanctions um, uh, against the government officials in the, in the Rwandan government who kidnapped my father and inflicted to torture onto him and and we knew that the moment those filing happened they were afraid they were scared for what was going to happen to them next and that led to more opening of doors that allowed for negotiations to proceed so we know there are tools they just have to be willing to employ them and we need as us as families and us as a community need to to hold them up to, up to account and, and encourage them to use them and if not shame them into using them 
Um, I don't know how much other geopolitics you cover, but I'm curious whether you think there's more leverage over a country like Rwanda, uh, relatively economically weaker, uh, versus a big country like China, second largest economy in the world, um, or, or Russia, a weaker economy, but still a large, large state. Mm -hmm. um, it, are the pressure points different as a result of size matters? Yes. Yes, size matters. And uh, in the case of Rwanda, you know, it's highly dependent on foreign aid. Um, I think it's, it's one of the countries that depends the most on foreign aid. And, um, and so those are, are, again, tools that can be employed in order to, um, to lead the government into ending this these, uh, system of, of abuse and, and human rights abuse and, as in kidnapping and silencing of journalists. Um, so I, I do think there is a difference here. And, um, and Rwanda is also viewed as an ally to many of the countries. Uh, because of, uh, of, of the, the history, the traumatic history that we know, but as an ally, then it should even be easier to get done to get this done. Um, I want to focus on, on what happened to you um, because you talk about tools and instruments, and a, a software tool and instrument was was used against you. Tell us about what happened. So my phone was targeted with the Pegasus spyware. Um, Amnesty uh, Tech, Amnesty International Tech team, as well as the Citizen Lab, discovered last year that my phone had been infected with the spyware and that the government of Rwanda was following my every move and my actions, my communications, as I was advocating for, for my, my father's release. Um, you know, there are many methods that the, the government's authoritarian regimes use to silence people, but in, in this case, they were trying to get ahead of, of us, trying to know who we were uh, talking to in order to stop our, our efforts to seek our father's release. And it was a huge shock for me. It was, um, it was shocking and scary, frankly, because I, I felt that I, I was no longer safe. That like everything on the phone they could see. Everything on the phone. You know, this Pegasus spyware takes full control of your phone. It has full access to your, to, your, to your locations, your emails, your photos, everything. And the forensics analysis that was conducted by Amnesty Tech as well as the Citizen Lab discovered that, for instance, when I walked into a meeting with the Belgian foreign minister, to advocate for my father's release, the spyware was it turned on and it stopped the moment I left that meeting. So they were present in the room and so I was not the only one spied on, everyone in that meeting also was spied on. And so um, this is to say this impacts more people than just the person that is being targeted and, and we should be afraid of, of this type of technology. Um, but if I can add one more thing which is even uh, more important to this efforts of seeking individuals uh, freedom who are people innocent people who are wrongfully detained um, is that Rwanda is as I mentioned um, a, a sip recipient of foreign aid it needs that aid in order to, to 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 function and they are choosing to deploy million dollar spyware on a person like me who's just advocating for for her father who's advocating for human rights and so that shows you what are their priorities and um, and also the methods that they use and and also so to, to highlight the impact of the tech community, you know, the tech community who d conducted this mm. forensics analysis was the one that elevated the, the story of Pegasus in the way that government officials then realized that their security was also being infringed, their privacy was also being violated. And so we're so grateful to, the, to this community that has um, decided to report on these cases, to elevate these cases and demand actions from governments um, around the world. Did you know about this kind of spyware technology and what, we, what it was capable of before <laughs> It I did not know. I did not know. I, I mean, I knew that the government of Rwanda uses terrible methods to go after people. Um, I never imagined that they would spend that they would put that spyware on my phone. And frankly, I felt that um, I had not been doing anything wrong. I was just speaking. I was advocating. I was contacting people, seeking for help. And um, the decision to to spy on on me is, is I think, um, completely crazy and and I think um, as I continue to learn about the power of this technology what it does I, I grew more and more afraid of even stepping out of my house sometimes knowing that they could be there waiting for me and for many years they followed my father they surveilled him they tried to intimidate him and then he ended up in Rwanda imprisoned on false charges and so my fear was that 
that could happen to me next. And, um, and that's why I've continued to speak up about this, this spyware, how authoritarian regimes use this spyware to silence people and intimidate um, activists. It's become quite a cause of yours since it happened. Um, where is your advocacy focused on? Are you seeing governments uh, ban it, for example? I just, uh, the Biden administration put out an executive order, I believe, right, um, to ban commercial spyware, which would include Pegasus. Yes, I know that um, different parliaments and, and Congress around the world are working to, to find ways to regulate it. Um, I can speak to it as I can tell you how I felt about it and I can speak to the feeling of having your entire privacy violated, of not feeling safe in your own home, in your own room and in, in wherever you go. And I think this story and being able to share my experience as a victim of the spyware, I hope will help um, government officials who are regulating this type of technology take the right um, actions. There's another way that your um, personal uh, or online digital life have, uh, has been invaded, which is on social media. I mean, I understand that you've been the target of a lot of uh, trolling online. Could, do you mind if you talk a little bit about that? No problem, yes. Um, so since I've started becoming a, a vocal critic of, of the regime because of what they were doing to my father and, and in seeking his release, I began to be attacked myself um, on social media. You know, the Rwandan government runs Twitter farms where they are attacking anyone that speaks up. And specifically, I think every time I would post a tweet, um, it would be met with hundreds of attacks coming from Rwanda, from people who are working with the government. And they were attempting to silence me, but they're also attempting to silence other people who were advocating for my father and who, were, who had joined the campaign to seek my father's release. Um, the fact and the scary fact is that happened to me, but I'm not the only one. There are so many people who are also speaking out about what's happened to them in Rwanda, in the region, or across the globe, and who are met with these attacks. And, and this, has a, this can bring a huge psychological toll on someone. And, and, I, and I hope that by talking about it and by pointing out these types of methods, which is another tool of the regime to silence people, um, how it's being deployed and how it impacts individuals, and hope that um, others will also speak out, but also that this will lead um, government to take the right pressure, to put the right pressure on this regime to stop these types of methods and to respect the freedoms and the rights of, of individuals. I mean, in the 20th century, if an authoritarian government wanted to surveil someone, they would have to send another human being to follow them. And now we have phones, right? I mean, techno-surveillance, techno-authoritarianism in the 21st century is much more thorough and efficient than what happened in the 20th century, which is a terrifying thought. Um, do you feel like, just looking at the global landscape, that... Uh, democracies and human rights um, are winning or, or do you feel like, do you buy into the narrative that there has been a global rise in authoritarianism? I, I do believe there is a, a global rise in authoritarianism and, and as I mentioned earlier, they are using the same blueprint and that's why uh, we need to ally with other democratic governments. Um, you know, there is um, the World Liberty Congress, which was which started um, last year by um, Gary Kasparov, Leopoldo Lopez and Masi Alinejad, uh, that brings different activists from around the world who are also trying to put together the same tools so that they can cooperate and, and advocate for democracy and advocate for justice and advocate for human rights in order to combat this, this rise of authoritarianism. And so I would encourage people to make those alliances, to, to learn from each other so that we can be stronger and, in fact, and allow uh, democracy to, to flourish. Yeah, I think that there's so many people, I mean, uh, uh, Chinese uh, artist, uh, contemporary artist and activist Ai Weiwei has in one of his interviews uh, with, with me has said that democracy is something you have to fight for every single generation. I think a lot of places have forgotten that. Mm. And also a lot of younger people, Gen Z, the polls show that uh, the Gen Z uh, group uh, and demographic have the least confidence in democracy um, in, out of any generation, which doesn't bode well for the future. 
Yes, um, and I think, you know, in the, in the case of my father, um, we were able to mobilize the youth across the globe. You know, we went to Europe, to in, in Africa as well, in Americas, in the Americas, in order to get young people to understand that they have a role to play in, st in fighting for freedom, in fighting for, human, for activists who are detained and highlighting these types of issues. And I think um, as we ally together, as we create alliances in order to, to, to combat the rise of authoritarianism, it is important to engage um, university students, high school students, for them to see the reality of what's happening. Um, you know, when I was taught, when my father was, was kidnapped, he, we called on everyone, you know, we told them about the kidnapping, we told them about the torture, and some people became interested and decided to act. Then the sham trial began, and then the legal community got engaged and monitored his trial and realized that it was a sham trial and brought more people on. And then the Pegasus spyware is found on my phone, and then you bring in a whole other community of people who would have perhaps not paid attention to these types of uh, um, of abuses and who are now paying attention and so when we are um, connecting all the dots when we are discussing these types of issues and bringing them in front of, of the youth that also needs to be to face the reality to know what is truly happening so that they can take the appropriate steps and so that they can grow knowing that they have a role to play in uh, in changing the way things are today and in ensuring that democracy continues to be um, the, the the method of, of operating on around the globe and on that note I think we should wrap here. Karine, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Melissa. We'll see you later, and in the meantime, stay engaged.